not going to call him now. Yeah, I already uh, we did that one. Okay. Test. Tomorrow should be the tester. Yeah. 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 Hey, she's back for two meetings in a row.
Is it Josh Case Codosol? Hi, Josh. Can you hear us? I can. How are you guys doing? Good. How about you? Good. I'm doing good. Good. Um, I heard you guys got some snow. Yeah, yeah. About two inches in Farmington and closer to four out in Aztec. So. Wow. That's a lot for down there. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, hey, we're, uh, we're going to get started here pretty shortly, so stand by. Great. Hey, Devin, Mike Stark. Hey, Mike. Uh, hey, uh, Mr. Totochina, come on, you see her? She's having trouble. She said she can't get the WebEx um, application to run on her laptop. So that's an IT situation. That's above my pay grade. Okay. I wonder if she can try She um, made as a as a panelist and as an uh, attendee, and she got further with the attendee than panelist, but it wants her to install something and won't let her. Can we have her call in? Uh, yeah. Do you have the number? Uh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hold on just a sec. The number is 408 418. Nine three eight eight, and the event number is one four six seven one four four five zero oh, three. Okay, let me let me give you a phone number. Okay. Man, Hey, Devin, do you have that access code again, please? It's one four six. Yes, exactly that number. Yep. Okay, great, Jim. We'll be looking for your call. Okay, thanks. Kevin, you okay with this one? Is two solo number?
Uh, commissioners, I was made the host. Hey, Josh, that's okay. We're uh, apologies for having some technical difficulties. Um, don't worry, uh, person's out, but not to worry. You don't have to host it. <laughs> Unless you're interested. Okay, Joe, sure. can you hear us? No problem. Uh, I hear you. Okay, and we can hear you. Okay. Can you hear her? Let me know. Yeah, I can hear it on the speakers. Okay, good. All right. Looks like, uh, and I guess Commissioner Sullivan, do you have anyone to do? Commissioner Sullivan, can you hear us? Oh, you just got muted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you, Devin, whoever it is. Yeah, it's uh, Jim. Devin's out. But... We'll call this a uh, meeting to order. We're running a little bit late with some technical difficulties, but uh, we'll just take that time uh, out of the CEO's time for the manager's time to present this tonight. So uh, make a note of that eight minutes comes out of uh, Mike's time. Uh, start off with the uh, invocation and Commissioner the mayor's agree to lead us in that. Lord, we ask that you uh, look over the folks that are traveling in this, this weather today and give us the power, strength, and courage to make good decisions. Um, look over the citizens that send them in. And in your name we pray. I'll lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. All right, that brings us to a presentation of the fiscal year 2019 Audit Accountability Award, Mr. Jim Collins. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, uh, it's actually a great pleasure uh, to present to you another award um, to uh, the Finance Department. Uh, you know, it's, it's actually in coordination New Mexico counties and the state auditor um, look at all of the different government, governmental entities uh, within the state uh, for ethical financial practices, outstanding uh, audits. Um, they look at the degree of findings, they look at uh, our reviewing our audits timely, and, and ultimately the results of those uh, audits. And so each year, uh, the uh, New Mexico State Auditor Brian Colon has the uh, pleasure of uh, presenting uh, at the conclusion of the legislative conference um, different awards. Uh, those awards uh, range from uh, continued excellence to the Glass Claim Award, uh, continued improvement, and uh, they actually added a CARES Act specialist, a special certificate uh, this year. Um, I'm happy to, uh, to present to you all uh, this FY19 Audit Accountability Award um, for the FY19 um, fiscal year. Uh, it's through the hard work and dedication of uh, the Finance Department, everything that means, and we have sound financial uh, practices. We're following all the procedures, we're following all the uh, state statute and, and federal sections that matter. Um, additionally, it's through all of the um, hard work and dedication to all of the elected officers in the county to um, help make that possible. Um, and so uh, today I wanted to um, ask that you all present this to Tim Martin uh, in um, recognition of this award. Um, and uh, yes, in a COVID safe manner, yeah. <laughs> 
Yes, I know. <laughs>
Can you hear me? Oh, we can now. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the commission. Um, this is David Buckholz from the Rody Law Firm. My colleague, um, Mr. Carrasco, is here with me. Um, this is the second of three um, presentations that we will be making to the board on this project. The first one was back in December uh, before the um, new commissioners came on, uh, where the um, commission uh, passed the initial uh, so-called inducement resolution, which indicated the interest of the uh, board to go forward uh, with this project. Um, today, you have before you um, the statutorily required resolution calling for your um, board to hear ordinances um, at the um, what will be the second meeting in February. Um, and then in February, you will consider this matter for the third and last time uh, considering um, the substance. What you have is industrial revenue bonds, bonds for which um, the commission has no financial responsibility, but as a vehicle to um, allow um, the developer in connection with this renewable energy project to achieve certain tax advantages with the state. Um, in this case, the developer, uh, Mr. Case is here today, and I'm sure he'll be happy to answer questions in regard to the details of this project, has agreed to pay all property taxes to the county, um, to the um, school district and to the college um, in connection with this project and is seeking only to avoid uh, the gross receipts and compensating tax. Um, it's a project that's broken into three parts, renewable energy components for a solar field, um, a battery facility and a transmission facility. Uh, Mr. Case would have more details on that. Um, uh, for a total amount of capital investment, not to exceed $450 million, and split up among those three uh, projects. Um, there have been discussions as recently as last week uh, with Mr. Stark, Mr. Cox, County Attorney, uh, Mr. Eccles, uh, my, my colleague, Mr. Crassel, myself, and Mr. Case's people about these details. And I believe that uh, information has been supplied um, to the CEO regarding the number of uh, temporary and permanent jobs that will be associated with the project and other relevant factors um, that will be considered in uh, going forward. Uh, if you pass this um, a resolution tonight, we will then um, proceed to a publication um, of the intention to adopt uh, ordinances at the um, meeting. That's the second uh, meeting in February. We have already sent notices to the um, uh, taxing jurisdictions indicating the expectation that this project may go forward. Um, and then, as I said, the final approvals, along with the final documents, will be presented for your consideration and approval um, at that meeting in February. Uh, we will, um, at that time, have all of the details of the payment in lieu of tax arrangements to be made relative to the property taxes, the documentations protecting the county in regard to any responsibilities other than its assistance in moving this project forward for tax purposes, um, and other matters that are typically considered in industrial revenue bonds. Um, the county itself has not done an industrial revenue bond in some time, although it did do one for Praxair um, about 10 years ago. Um, and this project is actually similar in structure to a number of projects that counties have been doing, particularly on the east side of the state, um, in rural areas, Torrance County, um, Lincoln County, Curry County, um, Guadalupe County. Um, this is the first one, though, um, that San Juan is considering, uh, but the structure and the requirements will be similar to what has been undertaken by um, those counties out in the east. So with that, I might turn things over either to the CEO or to um, Mr. Eccles, and then maybe uh, with the Commission's pleasure, they may want to hear a short presentation from Mr. Case. Um, I'll leave that up to the CEO, though, and I'll ha I'm happy to answer further questions if you like. Uh, Mr. Buckles, uh, I, first I want to thank you for presenting today. I know uh, you're, you're probably mourning the not having your, your good friend uh, Jack Horton during the meeting. Uh, but I appreciate the efficiency that you presented. This, uh, I do know there's at least one good friend of Jack Horton who's sitting on the commission now and 
Commissioner, I'm glad to see you as well. Uh, um, Jack and I knew, know each other for a very long time, and he did a great job um, both here at the county and then also for the University of New Mexico, as I'm sure you know. And, and you know, I, I, I think we have the better for I do want to bring up that we, we did receive two letters, uh, one from the Farmington Chamber of Commerce, or from the Farmington Chamber, and from the Four Corners Economic Development uh, Incorporated. And they were appreciative of the project that's coming in. Uh, but they and they sent letters encouraging uh, the the photo soul uh, that they that, and eight minute as they move forward that that they use uh, local contractors. Do you know if there's anything in place or if what the plan is regarding using local uh, labor contractors? Um, uh, oh, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Chairman, and um, Commissioner. Uh, when we come to you with the particular documents, we will create um, appropriate covenants in those documents for those purposes. But uh, if Mr. Case may want to answer particularly uh, what his expectations and his plans are uh, in the local construction area and in other areas regarding um, the use of um, uh, local businesses and local industry. Okay. Perhaps that'll, that'll be addressed. You said there was a short presentation. Um, I, either um, uh, CEO staff or, or Mr. Case may want to add a little bit on um, those particular details. Mr. Case, did you want to, to present at all? Yeah, I, I, if, if uh, the commission is interested, I can give a uh, overview of the project. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I don't have a PowerPoint tonight, uh, but, uh, but I have presented one uh, previously to the commission. Uh, this uh, first project is 200 megawatts uh, with 100 megawatts of uh, storage. It's a contract with Public Service of New Mexico. We'll be interconnecting at the San Juan generating. Um, the site is uh, about five miles northeast of uh, the San Juan generating station. We're estimating a, a total uh, capital expenditure uh, to install the project of around $400 million. Um, Peak construction. Um, we've we've just ran our EPC RFP and we're getting numbers between 350 and 400 uh, uh, construction workers out there at peak. And then uh, long term and maintenance jobs, uh, five to six uh, for the project. Um, the project was uh, approved by the New Mexico PRC in de early December of last year and went beyond appeal the first week of uh, of uh, January. So we're. Uh, I think we may have lost you. Oh, can you guys hear me? Oh, we can now. Thank you. Um, so uh, when, when I went past the appeal period uh, the first week of uh, January, so we're full steam ahead. Um, we plan to start construction in late spring of this year and uh, be online by June 10th, 2022. And uh, a comment on uh, local contractors, uh, we uh, use uh, local businesses as much as possible. And uh, we're encouraging our uh, EPC firm who will be uh, installing the project to, to hire construction workers locally as much as possible. And we're planning on having uh, job fairs Okay. And uh, uh, we, we do appreciate that. Is there, is that the end of your presentation? Uh, open to any questions. Okay. Um, I, I know there has been some talk uh, in a, and we appreciate that, uh, that uh, the property taxes are going to be paid in full. I think that that comes uh as a requirement under the ETA, and and but but we do appreciate that we appreciate these projects. Um, uh, I I did hear some discussion about uh, how the property taxes would be repaid if if they would be depreciated or if there would uh, uh, be some type of leveling uh, in regards to that. Um, I'm not sure where we're at in in those discussions. I think they're ongoing. Um, 
And I, I think I just kind of wanted to, to touch base on that to get your position on how how those two different models uh, relate to the ETA and if you know how how that would tie in with the ETA and meet the requirements of that act. Yeah, uh, we, we've been discussing that uh, with the county, and you know we're we we'd like to continue to keep discussing it, but uh, you know and. And uh, but uh, you know we're 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 open to it either way. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could, um, we are exploring with council um, to the company um, the appropriate way under law uh, as to how this may be accomplished. Um, as you probably know, um, the requirements of the statute um, changed as of. Um, July of last year, both with changes in the um, Industrial Revenue Bond Act and also uh, in the um, Transition Act. And so there's not a lot of history on the ground for how that calculation has been made other than to make sure that the jurisdictions are made whole. So uh, we're going to try to accommodate uh, what the county's needs are, what the school district and the um, uh, college's needs are, make sure that nobody has any questions in regard to whether those arrangements are appropriate under the act uh, and then come to a conclusion. And when we come to you in four weeks with the final documents, we'll have a presentation on how we concluded that and what we said in the documents that we'll put before you at that time. Okay. Mr. Buckles, do you know if we reached out to CCSD and the college to kind of fill out how th where they're at with that whole process? Yeah. My understanding is that we have a letter of support from the college but, and that attempts have been made to, the, to reach out to the school district, but that um, people have been sort of passing in the evening on, um, on making those communications work. Um, but I do think we have a letter uh, that companies obtain a letter of support from the college and is continuing to reach out to the school districts. And we will have to the school district and we will have to have that done before we come back to you in four weeks. And this is just a notice of intent. So we have time between now and, and before the actual rubber meets the road. That's correct. Okay. Any any questions? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Burkholds, this yes, is Commissioner good. Lanier. How are you, Commissioner? Good. How are you? Fine, thank you. Um, I apologize if you'd mentioned. What about the state tax? Are we abating those also? Um, there is a requirement at least for a portion of this um, tax, uh, the property tax. To be paid in connection with the transmission portion of the transaction, and we will work on that. Uh, a primary tax that the state is being abated from is the compensating tax. That would be the state equivalent of gross receipts taxes on the equipment that's being purchased, and the project will allow avoidance of that compensating tax. Um, the state property tax is small. Uh, the state only charges property taxes for g state general obligation bonds purposes, so it's relatively small. Uh, and I don't know whether we've reached a conclusion on the abatement of that or not, although in the past um, the county has um, approved an abatement of state property taxes. So in other words, to summarize that, there is a requirement in the Transition Act that, um, and in the new, new changes to the IRB Act, that some small portion be paid to the state on the property tax for the transmission uh, portion of the project. The significant abatement to the state is the avoidance of the compensating tax. And the smaller portion of the state property tax on the other pieces, I think we still haven't resolved how we'll go on that one way or the other. Thank you. Any other questions? I have, Mr. Chairman, I have one more question for you on the when you were talking about the employment, how many we were employing and the long term employment. What about I, I understand you're going to try to get your supplies from San Juan County also Is that the way I understood that. The supplies, uh, you mean, what are you referring to? Well, like the the um, the things it's going to take to build the, the solar panels, or do they come in in one package already 
ready to go. Um, the concrete that, that you're going to pour, stuff like that. Are you going to try to get all of that out of San Juan County? So we'll, we'll be hiring an engineering firm to construct the project. Um, I, I can't answer the question um, but, uh, right now, but I can get with them and see what they're planning. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I think I have one more question. Uh, Mr. Buckholz, is there, is it fair to say that the county doesn't take on any liability uh, regarding uh, proceeding with this? Uh, that is correct. Um, the documents will have appropriate indemnities and protections for the county um, in regard to um, uh, proceeding with the project. Uh, and further, um, the law would indicate that since the county is only um, operating in effect as a conduit, that is as a helper to the developer um, in regard to its obtaining tax benefits, that any uh, uh, ownership provisions that are required by the documents do not impose any liability provisions. So you have that protection of the law and further protections from indemnities, so the county would be protected in regard to those matters. Very well. Uh, I guess just one more question for Mr. Eccles before we proceed. Do we need to do three separate motions or can we do one motion including all three? <laughs> um, the way we set this up, Mr. Chairman, was we do one motion to approve the resolution and the resolution within its paragraphs approves the three notices of intent. So you only have to do it one time. Very well. I did say that right, didn't I, Mr. Carrasco? That's correct. Thank you. <laughs> so with that, if there's uh, no other questions, I'll stand for a motion. I'm a, I know you can't see me on TV, but I made a motion to. You're moving to approve resolution number 202139, is that correct, Mr. Sullivan? Yeah. Do I have a second? Okay. Having been moved and seconded, is there any further discussion? Not hearing any. Uh, those in favor of approving resolution number 2021-39 uh, and the three notices of intent to adopt ordinances number 114, uh, 115, and 116. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Not hearing any any opposition, I will assume that it was uh, passed unanimously uh, through our, our wonderful technology. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Thank you. That brings us to... Thank you. Thank you, Josh. That brings us to... Uh, our item number two, which is a review of boards uh, and committee appointments. And it's going to be presented by our county manager, Mike Stark. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and commissioners. Um, this is our annual presentation of this list to you for you all to review um, boards and committees by which the county, either by agreement or by nature of the board, we have a, a seat or multiple seats on those various boards. And so before you tonight is a draft list uh, that we've put together. Uh, a lot of these folks are, are carryover uh, representatives, some by nature of the board, for example, the communications, our criminal justice training authority, the sheriff would, would, would be the one that would fill that role. Um, and you see, that's just the first one on the list. Mr. Eccles also serves as legal counsel. And so we try to capture all those various boards um, throughout the county, like I said, by agreement or by by nature of the of the committee or board. So um, we have verified those uh, folks that are are non elected officials to see if they're willing to continue to serve on some of these boards, such as the DWI Planning Council, uh, the Farm and Range Improvement Fund, um, or just a, a couple examples. But uh, certainly, I would stand for any questions you might have and or any changes you would like to make to the draft list that's being presented to you tonight. Any questions for the uh, manager? Okay. 
No. Well, if there's uh, no questions or no changes, then I'll stand for a motion. I'll make a motion with the seven. Sir, it's been moved and seconded. Moved by uh, Commissioner Sullivan and seconded by uh, Commissioner uh, Fortner. Uh, is there any other discussion? Any further discussion? Not hearing any further discussion, uh, those in favor of approving the review or approving the boards and committee appointments as outlined in the draft uh, boards and committee appointments. Uh, those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Not hearing any opposition, I will assume that it was passed unanimously unless somebody uh, states otherwise now. All right, that takes us on to item number three, which is the Rockmont Solar and Storage Project. I believe Dan Nelson, the vice president of uh, Eight Minute Solar is going to be presenting to us. Uh, Mr. Nelson. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, honorable chairman and commissioners. Thank you so much for providing me the opportunity to spend a little time with you this afternoon. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, spend a few minutes introducing you to eight minute solar energy and then talk a little bit about the project and um, would, would love to then uh, answer any questions you might have. I am going to try to up my screen if modern technology works. Uh, let me know if you all can see this. We can see the, the PowerPoint. Oh, geez, technology works today. Thank you. That's uh, a miracle. <laughs> sort of. Um, I am going to see. I guess my, my video is not on, but I guess that's okay right now. So again, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. I'm really honored to be here. Um, I want to thank, before I, I jump into this, Mr. Stark, Mr. Cox, and Mr. Eccles for their time and support in, in um, uh, allowing us the opportunity to introduce 8-Minute and our Rockmont Solar and Storage Project to the county. Uh, really, really appreciate their, their time and energy and investment that the county's made thus far in terms of partnering with 8-Minute. And uh, we're really excited about moving forward with the county uh, on this project. Um, so, first, a little bit about who 8-Minute is. Um, we are the, the largest independent solar power developer in the United States. Um, we have about 20 gigawatts verse of, uh, of, of solar and storage projects currently in development in the U.S. We have over 2 gigawatts of PV power projects already in operation. Um, most of those are in California, uh, the Southwest and the Central area. Um, we currently have about 125 employees in the company. We're growing at about 25% a year from a headcount standpoint. We have offices in California and in Texas. Um, we do not yet have offices in New Mexico. Um, we currently uh, probably are working on about 25 projects. But currently, we have two projects under construction. One is a uh, massive um, project currently being built in Clark County, Nevada, on the Moapa Indian Reservation, uh, referred to as the Eagle Shadow Mountain Project. It's 380 megawatts. Uh, it, th what's really remarkable about that project is the PPA price, that is the price at which the power being generated at the project is sold to an off-taker. And in, as you probably know, in almost all cases, the off taker is a public utility. Um, that, that is one of the lowest solar energy cost in ever in a, the United States. Very, very exciting project. We also are currently working on a 250 megawatt project that we're constructing right now in Texas. Um, that was, Texas is a pretty exciting state for us because we just six months ago finished our first project in Texas. So, you know, it's interesting. I've been with a company, this is my fourth year. When I got here four years ago, the only projects we've done were in California and now we're in Nevada, we're in 
New Mexico and we're in Texas. Um, and really two things are driving that. One is the, 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 the demand for renewable energy power projects because they become so economic and efficient. And um, not only are they less expensive than coal, but they're even less expensive than natural gas in, in many, many cases. Um, and of course, the, the need to protect the environment is another driver. Um, um, and so it's been a very exciting time. Um, this is our first project in New Mexico, as we've shared with uh, your, your colleagues in the county and our new friends at Four Corners Economic Development, a number of us at, at Eight Minute Solar Energy, including myself, we have um, worked on um, utility scale solar power projects in New Mexico uh, in prior lives with prior companies, but this would be this will be eight minutes first project in in the state. Um, so jumping into the project itself, um, this will be a hundred megawatt utility scale solar power project, uh, coupled with a thirty megawatt four hour energy storage device. Uh, as you as you probably know, um, solar projects generate power whenever it's sunny. Uh, and what a, a, a battery, what an energy storage device allows the project to do is to store that energy when it's generated at peak sun, say at two o'clock in the afternoon, store it. And when everyone gets home from work and turns on their dishwashers and their um, televisions and turns down the air conditioning and stuff, you can release that power at the optimal time of day. So it makes that power much more efficient and valuable to the consumers uh, and to the public utility when you can control more when that, that energy is released into the grid. Um, the project, Rockmont, is actually two projects in one. The solar project is Rockmont Solar and the storage project we affectionately call Rockmont Storage. Um, but from an operational standpoint, it is one it is one overall project. It will um, sit on about um, 1,500 acres of land. Uh, it'll interconnect to the grid um, at the San Juan generating station, uh, similar to <laughs> some colleagues uh, that were, I think, recently talking to you. Um, and in fact, I want to take a moment and thank uh, Photosol because they're pretty much two months of, ahead of us in talking with the county and kind of explaining to you some of the, the value proposition of, of, of um, a self-pay IRB. So I want to thank our, our friends at Photosol for, for probably um, uh, allowing this to be a more uh, streamlined IRB process with the county. Um, the land on which the project will sit is primarily New Mexico State Trust lands. Um, some small private lands, but primarily it's state land. It's in the northwestern corner of the state. Um, I think I have a better map. Here we go. You see it's just north of uh, Kirkland, Kirtland and Fruitland, um, north of US 64, and just west of um, New Mexico, I think 170, which is the... Um, um, I think that's La Plata Highway. Uh, unfortunately, with the COVID, I usually come to these meetings live, and I get to go visit the where the where the site is going to be. And so, unfortunately, with the with the current lay of things, I haven't had the opportunity to get up yet to where the where the project is going to be located. Um, again, it will it will connect to the grid at the San Juan generating station. Um, it's similar to the project that the the county has just been considering. Uh, with Photosol, this uh, also is a replacement resource. Um, and what that means, as I think you, you know, is that um, the IRB that we are looking to put in place um, is not intended to save any local property taxes, not the county lo local property tax, not the school local property tax, nor the community college lo local property tax. Um, it is. Uh, singularly focused on, on the state tax um, 
savings that are afforded under the IRB structure. Um, and as you might imagine, when the public utility like a PNM puts out a request for proposals amongst developers saying, hey, we want people to bid an X size project for X megawatts, um, that RFP will indicate whether or not that project is a replacement resource or not. Um, and what it means to PNM is that they're going to pay more for the power because this project um, will will pay property taxes every year to the county and to the local taxing bodies that are in the county. Um, and that extra cost results in a higher charge for electricity. And PNM um, obviously is prepared for that. And so our proposals to them for the sale of electricity were a slightly higher than they would otherwise be. Um, but the bids that we did give PNM and our competitors did give PNM did assume that the state taxes um, would not be imposed. So um, that is why, even though it's a replacement resource and we're you know very excited to move forward um, with all the local taxes, it's still very critical for the project's success and ability to move forward to be able to minimize the taxes that are allowed to be um, avoided. From a timing standpoint, um, we, it, we're, we're very, very uh, um, right now in the late stages of development. Um, the facility was study, it's being completed this quarter. The, um, the LGIA, which is the agreement that allows us to get energy to the grid um, onto the big high voltage power lines should be executed this quarter, Q1 of 2021. Uh, our hope and expectation is that we will commence construction right at the end of this year, around December, sometime in Q4 of 2021, and that the power plant will be done and in operation uh, in the second quarter, probably June of 2022. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do between now and the end of 2021 when we start construction, and then it's gonna be very busy for about six months in um, San Juan County. Uh, a couple other pieces uh, uh, of, of the project. Um, with the pilot, we're estimating, um, let me step back, I apologize. Uh, the way that the replacement research works is that um, once you set up an IRB, technically, it's not subject to property tax, the project, because it's, quote, unquote, owned by the county. Um, accordingly, we enter into a pilot, a payment in lieu of tax agreement with the county, pursuant to which we agree to pay to the county and all the local taxing jurisdictions the amount of tax that we would have paid you if it was 100% tax. That's referred to as a, a, a pilot payment. Um, we estimate that that amount of pilot payments will be about $6 million during the first um, 10 years of operation and about $9 million over the first 20 years. The reason the first 10 years is $6 million and the second 10 years is estimated to be $3 million is because under New Mexico property tax law, the, the taxable value, the assessed value of that power plant goes down every year as its useful life um, uh, matures and it, it, it has a smaller remaining value. Um, the total investment expected is about $140 million. Um, that is about $110 million for the solar part of the facility and about $30 million of cost for the battery portion of the facility. Um, Turning to jobs for a moment, um, there will be about an average of 150 to 175 jobs for the six or seven month construction period. Um, the peak, uh, at peak, we expect to hit about 350 construction jobs. Uh, the permanent number of jobs, as, as you probably learned from Photosol, is a very modest number. These are not power plants that have hundreds and of moving pieces. Um, these are pretty static 
power plants where the solar modules sit out in the field and just absorb the sun's energy and convert that to electricity. Um, and so we're, we're estimating only three permanent jobs. Um, I did mention, if you can see this next page, that from a kind of quote unquote legal standpoint, um, Rockmont Storage and Rockmont Solar are in two separate legal entities. Accordingly, um, all the legal documents will have to be duplicated. There will be one for each, um, one IRB industrial revenue bond for each of the two legal entities. Uh, we have spoken with the county about that. Uh, Mr. Buckholtz, uh, your counsel, um, we've spoken with him about it. He's been sensitized to this. And um, I, I think other than killing um, more trees, sadly, uh, I don't think there's um, too much practical difference in, the, in this structure. Um, I think the last thing I can mention is um, kind of on the heels of some of the questions you asked our, our, our predecessor about local involvement. When we move into a community to build a power plant, this is a massive investment, not only for us uh, in terms of how much capital is going to be invested, but it, it, it's a big investment for the community too, inviting someone from outside in because we're going to be here for 30 years. I mean, this. This plant is going to operate for at least 30 years. And um, so when we go into a community to build a power plant, we we do as much outreach as we can. Um, we've had the opportunity to meet with Four Corners Economic Development last year. We have since become members of Four Corners. Uh, we coordinated with ECHO to provide some emergency food and relief um, you know, during the, the winter season. Um, and we look forward, we have not yet met with the county, uh, the college, but we're looking forward to meeting with them to see how we might be able to work together. And, um, and um, with that, I, I, I first of all appreciate you allowing me to provide such a huge amount of information in such a short period of time. Um, with, with that, I'd love to take any questions um, and uh, that you all might have. I don't know if that's a question, but I would I'd recommend reaching out to CCSD earlier than later uh, to make sure that you can have conversations with them. Um, sometimes it's difficult to to contact them, but uh, I'd, I'd encourage you to make those efforts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is uh, Commissioner Todacini. Yes, Commissioner Todacini. Uh, I have a question. Um, there's completed studies on the environmental side. We're in an extreme drought. And I'm wondering in the studies, have anything that is of uh, concern surfaced in the studies? I'd just like to know that. Mr. Nelson, did you hear the question? Um, yes. Hi, Commissioner. I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get to hear the entire question, but I, I think um, what I heard was inquiring about the project's water usage and understanding whether the project's water usage could disrupt um, further and exacerbate further some of the drought challenges that the county's having. Is that right? Is that accurate, yeah. Commissioner Totacini? Yes, thank you. Yes. So um, thank you. We did submit with our application um, some environmental study information to the county, um, which I can forward to you, Commissioner. Um, regarding water generally, what I, what I would say is the following, and, and again, we'll, we'll follow up on this question and get you additional information, but um, solar power plants do not use water normally. Um, again, these are inert um, modules that sit out in the sun and they absorb the sun's rays and they convert um, the sunlight to electricity. Um, and then that is submitted into the grid. There are not big steam turbines that consume lots of um, 
uh, any water. They're not coal-fired facilities that need water for other resources. There's not retainage ponds uh, or anything of the like. So the water usage is very minimal. The only time, in fact, that I, I'm aware of water usage is um, that under some operations and maintenance protocols, you will periodically wash the modules. Um, my understanding, though, is that's that's water that's trucked in and and been sprayed on. So short of um, some specific cleaning of the modules that happens on some type of periodic basis, uh, I don't believe um, there's really any water usage. Um, the the manner in which the project is constructed is done in conjunction and in, in, in cooperation with the authorities. And I'm I'm quite certain again that our our construction proposals and our permits uh, take into account the water requirements. Um, so the short answer is I don't believe we're going to use any water other than potentially to wash modules on a periodic basis. Um, but more specifically, we will follow up on this question, Commissioner, and get a um, more specific answer to you. Is there any other questions? Mr. Chair, I have a question. Commissioner Fortner. Uh, Mr. Nielsen, this is Terry Fortner. And I, I was just jotting down a, a few questions that I have just because I'm learning about solar plants. And I'm curious, how long does um, a battery store energy? So, um, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I, I believe that I'm a tax person. I'm not an engineer. Um, but I've been doing this, I've been building solar power plants for since 2008. So I've been doing it long enough that it's, I kind of stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night and I can, I can talk my way through most of this. So I can tell you as a non-engineer is that technically you can store energy as long as you want. It's like a battery. So if you wanted to leave it in there, you could. But that's not how you optimize and get the most value out of the battery. The, the way that it's generally considered to be a four hour battery. So what you would do, peak usage in most environments is around seven o'clock. That's when we all get home from work and that's when we're cooking dinner and washing clothes and the TV's on and the AC's on and that's the peak time. So if if solar energy, the, 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 the maximum generation of it, you know, hits at say three o'clock in the afternoon or two o'clock in the afternoon, and you really want to use it four hours later at seven. A four hour battery is really what you want because you store all that energy that's being generated in when 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 people don't need it most, and you release it four hours later when again when you have peak load, when you hit your peak load, particularly in the summertime when the heat's really high and everyone's cranking their, their AC, particularly when they get home. So a battery will typically charge every day and then it will release four hours later to serve that peak load. And then the next day it'll do it all over again. Um, but technically, again, I'm not an engineer, but my understanding is that technically, if you didn't want to ever release it, um, you, you could just let it sit there, but that would defeat the purpose of the battery. Keep in mind that batteries are you know, very expensive. As I explained, we're estimating upwards to $30 million um, on this, this battery storage system will cost upwards to $30 million. So um, if you just put the energy in there and let it sit, uh, that's a very expensive way to store a little bit of power. If you can do it every single day um, and you get 365 turns of the battery, then the cost to use it comes down precipitously. And um, do you know what the life of a battery is? Um, you know, another really interesting question. Uh, the solar power plant, let's step back a second. The solar power plant um, degrades in efficacy about one half of 1% a year or less. In other words, if we build a 100 megawatt solar power plant in a year, that power plant should still generate 99 and a half megawatts of power. And in a year later, it should generate 99.05 megawatts. It's just a half a percent degradation a year. So that after 30 years of running the power plant, 
it should still be generating 85% of the amount of power it generated on day one. Um, and so even though we estimate that it will have a 30 year useful life in all intents and purposes at the end of 30 years, no one's gonna tear that thing down because it's still generating 85% of what it was generating on day one. A battery is similar as I understand with the difference that, that the, the degradation each year is more than a half a percent. I don't know what that magic number is. I don't know if it's 1% or 10%, but it is a faster degradation than, um, than a PV power plant. So my understanding, um, and, and again, you have to, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm not an engineer, but my understanding is that you end up having to augment the battery, you know, later on in say year 10 or something, you have to just have to add some more battery to it to get it back up to the point where it's um, it, it can function as it was designed to function on day one. So that's kind of related to why you say 30 years, Dan. That's kind of well, your timeline. The reason we say 30 years is, is frankly economic. Um, if you're an investor, you know, you, you're, you need to get your investment back within 30 years. If you're a landowner and you want to rent the land, lease the land to us, you want to look at a 30 year horizon. Um, once you get past 30 years, you know, when you talk about things economically, the net present value of something, once you get out to 40, 50, 60 years, one, the net present value of that dollar is so minimal. And secondly, you get to a credibility thing because I could, I could tell you what I think power is going to be selling for in 60 years and no one's going to believe a word I say because because you know it's anyone's guess. So I think 30 years is kind of a rule of thumb to eat as the lifetime to economically consider a project like this. Okay, and I just have one more question and a dinner request. Um, what does it take on a daily basis or a weekly basis or what is maintenance like? What does that entail? Um, so what is maintenance like? So you know, the, the, the upside to this, the downside to this power plant is that it's only going to employ, say, three people on a permanent full-time basis. The upside to that is that you get $100 million, $130 million um, of, of tax base on your tax rolls and virtually no local services required to support that tax base because you don't need to hire teachers, you don't need to buy books, you don't need to add street lights, you don't need public uh, support because um, for all intents and purposes, this is like a brain dead um, power plant that sits out and just absorbs the sun energy. So what do those three people do? Well, if it, there wasn't a battery, there would probably only be one or two people there. And what they do is they mostly monitor the the electric systems, the, the, the computer systems, what's referred to as SCADA, which is an acronym, which I don't recall exactly what it <laughs> stands for candidly, but they spend a lot of time monitoring um, all of the computer systems to make sure it's working properly. Things do break occasionally. Um, our system will, is not, there's two kind of PV power plants. One is a fixed tilt where the, the modules sit at a certain fixed angle and um, it just sits there. And then another one is a tracker technology where the modules actually track during the day as the sun goes overhead, they track ever so slowly that the angle to the sun to try to align the modules up to the optimal angle to the sun at all times to maximize the amount of power that it generates. And so when you have a tracker project, which again, Rockmont will be, um, it does require some more operations and maintenance because you have a little bit of moving pieces, certainly compared to a fixed tilt power plant. So it's it's operating the computer systems, managing the computer systems. It's um, keeping uh, the tracker systems running. Um, it's and then the reason I mention you know what it would be without an energy storage system is an energy storage system is a large um, uh, it's a large 
physical asset. And that requires uh, constant attention by one of the technicians to manage it, to make sure it's in proper working order, to make sure that nothing's breaking down on it, um, to, to, to basically oversee and um, ensure that the entire facility and all the equipment in it is being properly maintained at, at uh, any given time. Thank you. And I guess just my last comment is that maybe we can take a tour. I'd like to see what a battery looks like. <laughs> I just am curious about that. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, we let us look into that. Obviously, we're kind of all anxiously awaiting COVID-19 to be in our rear view mirror so we can all travel again. Um, but we would certainly be willing to uh, happy to facilitate that. We, as I mentioned at the outset, we do not have another project in New Mexico right now. Um, so we can't take you to one of our um, existing projects, but I'm sure there are some projects in New Mexico um, that have an energy storage uh, component. And we will find that out and, and get that to you, find the closest one and see if we might be able to facilitate a, a tour. Thank you. No, well, just throw out there that Vegas is in Clark County. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Let's throw that out there. I have to tell you, uh, the, the, the project in Las Vegas, uh, well, in Clark County, thank you, does not have an energy storage um, uh, system attached. It's just, just PV. Um, it's just PV. All right. Any other questions, comments? No. Mr. Nelson, thank you for, for presenting to us today. We look forward oh, to working you. with you. I very much appreciate the time and I look forward to promptly following up on these couple of questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. That brings us to uh, our report from our county manager, minus eight minutes. Minus eight minutes. Um, I guess that's uh, a tribute to the eight minute solar presentation, right? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and commissioners. Uh, just a quick update, as you know, today was the start of the legislative session in Santa Fe, a 60 day session. And uh, this will be a very different session than we've ever encountered before, uh, given it will be a hybrid session uh, with um, legislators uh, there for certain periods of the session. Um, the House, I think, having a different set of rules from the Senate and how they're going to operate. Certainly, I think, you know, I'm sure we'll learn more this evening um, as they started the session and worked through um, initial bills. But I know the House was speaker was proposing a five bill limit per legislator, um, and that was not the case in the Senate. So uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, how that plays out. I can tell you. As you know, we use the New Mexico legislative reports system um, here. And then, of course, New Mexico counties, which we um, are part of that organization, professional organization, uses that same session. As of right now, there have been 265 bills, either pre-filed or introduced today. Uh, and we're tracking those all uh, very carefully using our tracking system. And, of course, we'll uh, be weekly, if not in some cases daily, certainly when we get near the end of the session, updating you on the progress of bills and if it's a bill that would be uh, potentially adverse to San Juan County or maybe a bill that we would support. We, you know, I would bring those forth to you for, for your awareness and consideration. Um, but like I said, it's going to be extremely different on how we interact. Um, you know, only legislators, their staff and a small number of media members will be allowed inside of the roundhouse. Everything else will be done virtually. Uh, we assume that, that the public and, and other interested groups will be able to appear remotely to provide comment during committee meetings and um, and, and to, to get that feedback to legislators. Uh, but I, I think obviously making sure we stay in, in close contact with our local legislators, which we always do, but certainly more important this year to get a feel for, for what's happening and where things are heading. So, um, you know, this session, the uh, the deadline for bill introductions is February 18th. And so um, we're just at the tip of the iceberg as it comes to more bills to come. So we'll be doing lots of reading, lots of evaluating, and lots of tracking. Uh, and this, of course, the session ends uh, March 20th. 
And so uh, a lot is going to happen between now and then. So um, never hesitate to reach out for any anything that you might need relative to that. So, uh, and then with that, the New Mexico County's Winter Conference. Um, normally, we'd be down there um, this time of the year. I'm probably thankful that we can do this uh, virtually, given all the snow we had. That wouldn't have been a fun travel day today. Um, but uh, anyway, that that takes place uh, starting tomorrow with general sessions and some good topics there. And and certainly, if you need any help with accessing those, please let us know. So and that's all I have for you tonight. Any questions? That's it. Oh. You said eight minutes. <laughs> you kept it to four. All right. Well, any any questions for uh, our manager? All right. Gets us to reports from elected officials and department heads. We'll start with department heads. Don't even get to hear from Mike. Mestis? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, I did speak to Mr. Mestis earlier, and uh, you know we discussed if there was anything of, of value at this point, certainly related to COVID. Um, I think last meeting we provided a fairly robust update regarding um, vaccinations, the vaccination distribution schedule, and I know his office has been in close, close contact with the Department of Health and, and trying to fully maximize the, the vaccines that are being distributed to uh, our area. And I think the number one takeaway, and I know even internally here uh, with our employees at the county, if you're interested in getting uh, the vaccine, please go to the state's website to register. Um, there is a phone number that's available. Uh, unfortunately, it, 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 it seems to be very difficult to register via phone. I know Commissioner Sullivan, if he's still on the line, has had his own personal experiences uh, trying to do that. But it, uh, anyway, um, if you can register online, please do that. Uh, that's going to be the best way um, for, for anybody uh, here tonight in the meeting, uh, online, or in our community in receiving a, a vaccine. So that's critical. All right. Any reports from elected official or? That's down it. I think the last two days were in the 60s and today's in the 30s. That's great. I didn't realize that. But we have to get down to what? A rolling average of eight or less? Uh, ten eight, or less? eight per 100,000, which for us equates to 10 over a 14 day period uh, and a positivity rate under 5%. Both of those to be able to move into the green category. If you hit one of those markers, you're able to move into the, to the yellow category. Uh, Harding County is in green as of the last update, uh, and I believe uh, Union County is in yellow. Uh, what's interesting to note there is, is there hasn't been any consistency. Um, so we've had counties uh, since the inception of this um, program from the state that no one's maintained their status over a two-week period. Um, they've always, if they reached a, a yellow, they've retracted back. Um, they haven't continued that into a two week period. So I'd be curious to see if Harding and or Union can, can change that dynamic. All 800 of them can stick with it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you believe, you... Mr. Chairman, that there are more cows than people in Harding County? To That's, that, that is what they say, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Any other, any other reports from elected officials? Okay. Hey, uh, Commissioner Sullivan. Yeah, you might you know, uh, 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 I got in on that number. They called me back. I just called them and left my number, and then they called back. Oh, well, good. That's a good update, Commissioner Sullivan. All right. Yeah, I just yeah, I just, uh, uh, because uh, 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 four and uh, 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 a number, and then. Prompted to punch zero, and and then I had to punch four, and then I punched one, and then I don't know. I just went where they told me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm not going to skip over comments, uh, input from the general public this meeting. And Mr. are there any? 
Chairman, we did not receive any in our office via email, fax, or um, written correspondence. And I don't know, Mr. Cox if, or Mr. Neely, if you're able to to see anybody on there that. Mr. Chair, I don't see anybody here that has indicated they're interested in speaking at this time. Mr. Neely, are you feeling better? Uh, about as well as I can be, sir. Thank you for asking. Good. All right. Um, with there not being any comments from the general public, that brings us to the end of our agenda. And I'll declare this meeting adjourned. Good job, John. Have a great night.